Hi, this is Rabbi Jeremy from Mahar, and this is our Kabbalat Shabbat service for October 1st, 2021. So this is the first weekend after the long run of Jewish holidays that started with Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, and ended finally with Simchat Torah earlier this week. So we're now kind of coming off of that, and we're coming into the part when in a lot of congregations, we're starting to read the Torah cycle all over again. So we'll talk a little bit about that Torah portion, Reshit, the very first Torah portion in the Torah. We'll talk a little bit about that and a few other things as we go through this short little Kabbalat Shabbat service for you to use this weekend. And we'll start by greeting each other with the traditional song Hine Matov. <laughs> does, that song means see how good it is, how pleasant when peoples dwell together. And I mention almost every week when we're together for Kabbalah Shabbat on Zoom or when we're doing these videos that we change the words a little bit from the original psalm to say Hine Matovu Manayim Shevet Amim peoples rather than Achim which literally means brothers. And Hebrew has this thing where if there's more than one person, you use plural, right? So brothers, um, but then Hebrew distinguishes between masculine and feminine in ways that we sometimes don't in English. And so brothers comes in and is supposed to mean brothers and sisters. And we use amim instead in order to kind of work with a word that really has a broader meaning than just the masculine or feminine versions of a Hebrew word. And so we use amim to mean peoples or nations or tribes or whatever you want to say, rather than achim, brothers. So I'll recite blessings for the various pieces of a typical Shabbat kind of kiddush, right? The candles and the challah and the wine. Um, although I don't have a set right in front of me, but if you have your set, you can feel free to follow along with the blessings as I recite them, and you can light your candles or sip your wine or your grape juice or whatever you happen to be using and have some challah or whatever you happen to be eating. So we'll start with candles. Nivarech et ha'or ba'olam, nivarech et ha'or ba'adam, nivarech et ha'or shel Shabbat, let us bless the light in the world, let us bless the light in humanity, let us bless the light of Shabbat. And for our wine blessing, Nivarech et Yotzrei pri hagafen, let us bless those who create the fruit of the vine. And if you have challah or bread or something like that, Nivarech et hamotzi'im lechem min ha'aretz, let us bless those who bring forth bread from the earth. I mentioned during the high holidays that blessing is a confusing word. In American culture, 
we use blessing in a particular way, and it's a way that's really influenced by non-Jewish theology. So we talk about the blessings of democracy and the blessings of freedom, and we talk about getting a parent's blessing when we might be interested in getting engaged to marry somebody. Or you'll go to a store and a cashier will say, have a blessed day. And what that blessing, that meaning of blessing means is actually not the way traditionally Judaism means the word blessing. Traditionally, the way Judaism means the word blessing, this word um, baruch, blessed, is not here, have some blessings. It's instead a form of expressing gratitude. So it's less a question of let us bless, as in the sense of let's give blessings to somebody, and more the sense of nevarech, let us acknowledge, let us thank. And it's possible, possible that that meaning, that set of meanings for bless that we have in Hebrew, which encompasses both the acknowledgement, thanks kind of thing, and the blessings of democracy kind of thing. It's possible that the, the main way we've used it traditionally in Judaism as this kind of way of acknowledging and thanking comes a little bit from the meaning of the word barach, this root, bait, resh, kaf, because there's a noun connected with it, berech. Berech means knee. So how do you give thanks in a, a, a system of a culture where people are accustomed to dealing with royalty or where people deal in prayer, will you bend your knee? So, berech as knee, baruch, blessed, meaning thanks. Maybe there's a connection. Maybe there's not. I don't know. It's a little hard to tell, but it makes a little bit of sense. And so one of the things that we do on Shabbat more than we maybe do other times is to stop and to express gratitude. That that's one of the blessings, the good thing that comes to you from Shabbat is that there is a time for you to take stock and to then recite blessings of Thanksgiving. So with that, we want to kind of welcome Shabbat to us or welcome ourselves to Shabbat, let ourselves have Shabbat. There's lots of different ways to think about that. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by singing songs that are about Shabbat. So we'll start, we'll do two songs, and one will be one that's pretty easy to pick up, Bim Bam. You may already know it. Um, it's, it's very difficult. It has six words, Bim, Bam, Shabbat, Shalom, Cheery, and Beery. So hopefully you can pick those up.
And really, all of that meant was Shabbat Shalom, good Shabbat, right? And then everything else was just Ben Bam and Cherry Berry, which is pretty easy to pick up, makes it easy to learn the melody that way. And the other song that we'll do is Lechado Di. So Lechado Di is a traditional song written by Kabbalistic Jews, by Jewish mystics, for Kabbalat Shabbat, for welcoming Shabbat. So we'll sing that song together using humanistic lyrics that were really written for the Kabbalat Shabbat kind of setting of, um, of Lechado Di. They were adapted from traditional lyrics by Rabbi Jeffrey Falick. <laughs> And so that song, as we have our lyrics, is about welcoming one another to greet Shabbat joyfully and with excitement because Shabbat's a chance for us to take a break. We don't get a lot of chances to take breaks sometimes in modern American life. So this is a chance for us to take even 15, 20 minutes, however long this video turns out to be, be about 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes for us to just kind of take a break and take some time for ourselves and together as family. So I mentioned that we kind of restarted the Torah reading cycle in a lot of congregations this week. And so we started back at the beginning. And the name of the Torah portion that starts the Torah is Breshit. That's also the name of the book in Hebrew. The book of Genesis is called Breshit in Hebrew. And it doesn't actually mean in the beginning. We're kind of accustomed to hearing it translated as in the beginning, and that's not actually quite right, um, because it's actually, if you translate it literally, in a beginning, and so a lot of people think that it's at a beginning, at the beginning of a process, rather than in the beginning, as though that's the very first thing that ever, ever, ever happened. Or at least that that's the thought that that's what the Torah is trying to say is at the beginning of this process, more than it is really at the beginning, there was never anything before. So what's going on in this Torah portion? There's a lot that happens in this Torah portion. We have two creation stories. We have the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and then being kicked out. And we have the story of Cain and Abel, um, Adam and Eve's first two children. And Abel offers a sacrifice that seems to be more pleasant, and Cain gets jealous and kills Abel, and we have all these kinds of 
origin myths that are built into this Torah portion. And one of the challenges in being a humanistic Jew is to say to yourself, well, what do I do? What do I do with these stories? I mean, modern, every modern Jew really has to deal with this if they are, you know, more or less accepting of the idea that science suggests that the way things happened is not the way it was happened or the, not the way it was reported in the book of Genesis, right? The book of Genesis gives two different creation stories and in any event takes six days to create the whole world and humans are created on the last of those six days and on the seventh day there's a period of rest and when I take this story into classrooms at our Jewish cultural school, you have to ask, do you think the world was created in six days? And inevitably, inevitably, one of our students says, no, the world is six billion years old and dinosaurs lived X, X number of million years ago. And of course it didn't take six days. So why do we keep using this story? Why do we keep this book around? Why do we keep reading this book? Why do we keep talking about this book if we think that the things it says are maybe not really factual? And there are all kinds of different ways to answer this, right? So there's the answer that, you know, religion and science are trying to do different things. And I have to tell you, I don't think that's true. I think religion and science spend a lot of time doing exactly the same thing and answering exactly the same questions and coming to very different answers. But there is something about literature, about literature that socially becomes really important for us. And it's a good reminder, dealing with it, having to wrestle with it, is a good reminder that it's not just the facts out there that we can put our hands on or measure or that we can infer that mean something to us, that our stories mean something to us. The questions we ask mean something to us, that the creative reframing of ideas, being creative is important to us. And so, no, we don't think that the book of Genesis describes the way the world came to be. And we don't think it describes the way life came to be. But we can recognize in it an attempt to find a place in the world and an attempt to try to understand what's going on and an attempt to struggle with the unknown. And so the book of Genesis, these, these stories in this first Torah portion that simply don't, couldn't possibly have happened, some of them, right? We still read this book because there's still value in grappling with the past, in grappling with our uncertainty. And this is one way of finding ways to address it, is to look at these stories and to tell stories about ourselves that help us fix our place in the universe, that help us to better understand, maybe not factually, maybe not intellectually, but at an emotional level, who we are and where we stand. And so it's worth to continuing to read these works just for that purpose. Knowing what we're seeing there isn't what we think happened. But what we're seeing there is an example of what we still do today. And using that as inspiration for telling our own stories. So with that, that's the end of the Devar Torah for the week. It's not a long one. With that, we do wanna make sure that we take a moment to review the stories of the people that we miss the people that we can't be with, the people who are ill, the people who have died, the people who were just separated from by a great distance. We wanna make sure that we bring their stories to memory because they are about us as much as they are about them. And as we remember those folks, as we remember those people, and for some of us, as we remember those pets, as we remember these animals who played huge roles in our lives. And this is the Torah portion, Brashid's the Torah portion, where humans supposedly name animals. As we remember those, those people, as we remember those living beings who've come into our lives, we sing a song of peace, Na'aseh Shalom. 
song hoping for peace and this will be our concluding song and we'll wrap up with this Onyabo Shalom <laughs> So I hope that you have a good Shabbat for however long it is, and I hope that I'll see you again online soon, either on YouTube, where we can't really say hi to each other, unfortunately, or on Zoom, where we can. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>